Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third session. We should be starting in about five minutes at 10 o'clock. So there's time to grab a, a quick cup of tea if you haven't already. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people coming in to the meeting, which is really, really good. We're a couple of minutes away from starting. So if you're about settled, that'd be great. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, our third session of the BTO Annual Conference. 
This year, we're sorry that the pandemic means that we're not able to actually meet in person at Swanwick in Derbyshire, but we're incredibly grateful for all of those of you who are able to join us for these online sessions. My name is Mike Toms, I'm the BTO's Head of Communications, and I'm your host for this morning's session. We have three great talks uh, lined up, and after each talk, there will be some time for questions. If you are unfamiliar with the Zoom platform, uh, you should find somewhere on the screen, probably towards the bottom, um, a Q&A button, which you can uh, click on, and that will open up um, a function where you can enter your question. And what I will do is, as we come to the end of each talk, go through those and uh, ask those questions on your behalf. Other audience members can uh, click on the thumbs up uh, button next to some of those, and that will actually elevate questions up. So if you spot a question there that you think is really interesting and you kind of might want to have asked yourself, then click on the thumbs up and that should elevate it. If you're watching the session on a mobile device, possibly an iPad or a smartphone, uh, you might find that when we switch between uh, the presenter view, so the person talking to you, and their shared screen, which is kind of their PowerPoint, uh, that you only see one. And typically you just need to swipe left or right. Uh, what we've discovered is it varies hugely depending on what system you're using, what hardware you're using. So uh, if you get stuck, uh, just have a little fiddle and see what you can do there. So over the course of this week, uh, we've got something like 14 free talks. We've got a couple of panel discussions tonight. We've got one on youth engagement. And these have really only been possible uh, thanks to the support of BTO members. So thank you to everybody uh, that's been here today and has come to any of the other sessions. Income from memberships and from donations make up about half of our charity's total income. And without your support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do uh, today. And as you're probably aware, this is a, a tough time for charities. Uh, the sector as a whole has seen a decline in income of about 40%. And uh, BTO has fared a little bit better. We think we're down about 27% uh, on where we really need to be in order to deliver on our charitable activities. So it, we know that you support us in many, many different ways, and we're hugely grateful for that support. But if you are in a position to make a donation to support our work now, then we would be incredibly grateful. And you can see there's a, a link on the slide here today. If you're not a BTO member uh, and you've enjoyed today's talks, then do consider becoming a member. You know, the membership of the BTO and our volunteers are our absolute lifeblood. Uh, they, it's through them that we can inspire and educate people and we can advance our collective understanding of birds through the research that we do. So this morning's session then, our focus is on UK birds of conservation concern, and in particular on those species that appear on the red list. So in addition to talks on two of those species, Arctic skewer and puffin, we're also having a discussion um, about Red 67, which is a project that worked to raise the profile of red listed birds. So what I want to do now is introduce the first of our speakers, and that's the BTO's Sarah Harris. Sarah is responsible for the national coordination of the Breeding Bird Survey and the Waterways Breeding Bird Survey, the two of the UK's core monitoring schemes that are coordinated by BTO. And she also works in partnership with Butterfly Conservation, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and JNCC in running the wider countryside butterfly survey through Breeding Bird Survey Squares. Sarah's a birder, she's a, a ringer, and she's part of the BTO team that is carrying out research into the decline of Arctic skewer populations. And that's what she's going to talk about this morning. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, Sarah Harris. Okay, thanks Mike for the uh, introduction there. So um, as Mike touched on, I actually run the Breeding Bird Survey and the Waterways Breeding Bird Survey, but I was uh, really lucky to have been loaned out to the wetlands team to help them with some Arctic skewer tracking work. And this is what I'll be speaking to you about today. Um, so why have, have we, uh, taken on this journey to uh, look into the declines of Arctic skewers. So they are, um, we are at real risk of losing these as a UK breeding species. 
Um, they've declined by 81% since 1986, and this is actually um, the greatest decline of any UK um, breeding seabird. So really um, dramatic declines being seen there. It's a red list listed uh, species of birds of conservation concern. Um, and it could also be quite a good indicator of the health of the wider marine environment. Um, these birds will uh, steal food from other seabirds. Um, so they're kind of the top of the food chain there. So it can give us a bit of an indication of what's going on. So we know that they're breeding in the north and wintering in the south. Uh, we don't really know what's happening with the populations globally. Um, in some areas, they're quite well studied and it looks like they're either stable or in uh, decline. So there's a lot to be discovered about Arctic skuas um, at a global scale. Here in the UK, we know that they've got quite a restricted range. They're at the southern edge of their global range um, and we tend to see them breeding in the north of Scotland and northwest of Scotland. And we've got um, just over 2000 apparently occupied territories, but this was from a survey Seabird uh, 2000, so um, a lot has probably changed since then. Um, so on the map on the right, we can see birds ringed in um, Britain and Ireland and uh, where their rings have been found. Um, so there's quite a few uh, recoveries there. And then we've also got birds that were ringed elsewhere. So just up the top here, tiny little dots there um, and found in Britain and Ireland. But you'll notice that these are um, seabirds and most of the recoveries are being found along the coastline. So probably not giving us a very good idea of what's happening when they're out at sea uh, foraging. So um, we, from looking at these birds and their colonies, we know that sometimes they're in little clusters, um, but you do also get birds just out breeding um, pretty much on their own in some areas as well. So. Um, we say that they're breeding loose colonies. We think that their foraging range is um, about 10 kilometers at most. They're staying pretty close to home during the breeding season, um, that they've got a, a variable diet and that they're long distance migrants. So if we look at seabird populations overall, um, we can see from this uh, indicator that it's not looking too good. There's lots of seabirds that are in decline. Uh, one of the major things that comes up time and time again with seabird declines is food availability um, and often that's connected to climate change and the a bit of a mismatch between the peak food availability and when birds really need uh, that supply of food to feed their chicks. So sand eels crop up a lot um, when we're talking about a lack of food at the right times of year. Another thing that comes up in the UK quite a lot uh, is the pressure of great skuas on our breeding Arctic skuas. So um, this is this might be taking eggs from the nests. This could be uh, eating the chicks or something that we're seeing quite often on fair isle is um, the birds waiting until the Arctic skuas have just fledged and they're just starting to um, go on a bit, a bit of an adventure away from their nest site. And then the great skuas come along and um, eat them at that stage. So that's something that could be getting overlooked um, as the kind of nest monitoring is over by this point. But um, then that's when the great skuas might be having their impact. And the other thing that we've been looking at is um, the distribution of great skuas on fair isles. So it might be that um, they're pushing the Arctic skuas to less favourable um, nesting sites, just kind of bullying them out of uh, the places they really want to be uh, nesting and also from this map you can see that uh, a lot of the arctic skewer nests are around kind of the airstrip and along the paths and that could mean that the birds are getting pushed to the edges and then also possibly being disturbed by uh, people going about their daily business on the island so there could be a knock-on effect there as well. So globally, um, as I said, Arctic skuas are at the southern edge of their global range and heat stress is something that comes up fairly often uh, with seabirds as well. And this could be with a, a warming climate, the birds are overheating while they're trying to incubate uh, on the nest. And on um, Feral, we, we were seeing birds fidgeting quite a lot and getting off the nest, leaving the nest unattended while they went to bathe and, and try and cool down a bit. 
Um, so we suspect that might be um, something to do with it as well. Uh, elsewhere, so I'm thinking kind of Canada, Alaska, the Faroe Islands, we're seeing birds are occasionally shot as well. We don't know really if that's having an impact on the population. Um, and again, in Norway, there's been reports of power lines causing issues to some colonies as the birds are flying into the flying into the power lines. So these are all things that could be playing a part as well, but um, kind of at a global scale rather than here in the UK. So um, just to give you a quick outline of our research, we started fieldwork in 2017 and we went to Feral. We thought this was a good place to start. There's lots of historic data on the skewers, but also on um, food samples from orcs as well. So the sort of food that might be available around the island and tracks from uh, orcs as well. There's between about 30 to 35 apparently occupied territories, so a nice sample size. Um, as I say, there's lots of background knowledge. So the staff at Fair Isle Bird Observatory were always on hand to help us, point us in the right direction, tell us where the birds have been hanging out and that sort of thing. Um, we set off with some GPS tags and GLS tags. I'll come back to those for a minute and just carried out monitoring in general. Then in 2018, we expanded our research to Orkney as well. There's an island there, Rouse, and that um, the breeding population out there has a higher productivity. So it's quite nice to be able to compare the two sites. We've got expert volunteers out on Rouse, David and Helen, who have been studying the birds there for years. So know a lot, a lot about the birds in the site. Again, we, we deployed some GPS tags, GLS tags and um, retrieved some as well. Uh, we use thermocrons and camera traps. So I'll come back to them in a minute. And in 2019, it was basically more of a cleanup operation, just trying to get as many GLS tags back as we could and carry out the nest recording. So just to run through the gear, we used um, geolocators. So these are fixed to the bird's ring. Um, they stay on permanently until we catch the bird again. They last about two years um, and they take a fix about twice a day. And we use global positioning systems, which are glued to the bird's back. And that lasted for as long as the, the glue stayed, stayed on the bird. Um, and they were used during the breeding season to look at foraging and they took a fix every 15 minutes. The bird then had to return to the colony where the data would be downloaded to a base station. And then from the base station, we'd plug, um, plug in the laptop and download the data onto our laptop. So quite um, labor intensive, but got us some really nice um, more precise data than the, uh, the GLS tags on the leg. And it was all going really well and we had lots of help and support from the locals on Fair Isle, but um, this day, uh, on this particular occasion, we had a sheep trying to destroy a, a kind of thousand pounds worth of base station by just running at it as hard as he could. So we had some things like that to overcome as well. Um, the other device we use are thermocrons. These are relatively cheap and they are put into the bottom of the nest cup, as you can see here. Um, and then the eggs are just uh, put on top of those and we can measure uh, fluctuations in temperature. So for as long as the bird's incubating, temperature remains pretty stable. And then as soon as incubation finishes, whether that be because um, the nest has failed or the chicks have hatched, you start to see fluctuations in temperature. Um, so that can help us figure out when, when nests stop being incubated. And then it, alongside camera traps as well, we can look at predation events, but also um, if you were to watch it continuously, you could look at it, um, change over times as well. And we also took feather samples to sex of birds, and as I say, monitored all the birds on the island. So we'll get on to the results now, because this is the uh, really exciting bit. I will say that all my pictures make it look like Fair Isle was just constantly sunny, but sadly that wasn't the case. I think that's just the days I took the camera out. So if we start with the breeding season movements, we can see data from Fair Isle from 14 tags. So these are in 2017 and 2018. So this, these are just the tags that stayed on during the breeding season, the glued to the back of the bird. Um, some, some of the birds we tagged in both 2017 and 2018, uh, but quite often they were different individuals. When we looked at differences in foraging between males and females, there wasn't really anything obvious there, so that doesn't seem to uh, be a divide in any way. Uh, you remember earlier I mentioned that birds tend to stay within 10 kilometers of their, their nest site um, during the breeding season. Well, we had one here that you can see that almost went 600 kilometers. So this was 
unbelievable when the data started coming up on the screen and we could see this bird was just going just further and further south and uh, yeah went off towards Dogger Bank and back. So that was uh, quite exciting. Um, we could also see during the incubation period here, this is 2017 on Feral, um, you can see the different colour lines, the different birds, and we can also look at the speeds the bird's travelling at. So um, we're getting a fix about every 15 minutes, so we're seeing when the birds are hanging out in certain areas, and this could be very uh, important to narrowing down where they like to kind of, it could be feeding sites, it could be loafing sites, so that's potentially quite important. And we're seeing that during incubation, the maximum distance is about 200 kilometers. And if you overlay the data from RSPB and their um, foraging of orcs, uh, they've been tracking orcs, it kind of looks pretty similar to this. So um, that was a really nice little thing to do is to overlay the two tracks and see that they're kind of going to the same places as the Arctic skewers. So we had one successful nest in 2017 on the whole island um, and it happened to be a bird that we'd put all of the tags on um, and so this was a, a real star bird. We can see here that um, the yellow line is during incubation and then the red line which is just up over Feral pretty much just hanging around the island uh, maximum trip of 14 kilometers from Feral. Um, so as soon as the, the chick had hatched, the uh, foraging range reduced massively. And if we look at foraging range for successful nests in general, looking at browse data and feral data, we're seeing trips aren't really any further than about 70 kilometers. So the further along the breeding season um, you go, the closer to home the birds are sticking. And here we have some tracks from um, July 2018 and we've got the yellow dots from feral birds and the white dots from rousey birds and they're all head, heading out from rousey in various directions. Feral tends to be towards the south and again you can see the dots of the, uh, the slowest movements so places the birds are hanging about rather than traveling through. And it's quite interesting to see that when you overlap a little divide there the birds tend to be going to their own locations from each colony. There doesn't seem to be very much of an overlap between the Rousey birds and the Feral birds and where they're foraging. And this could be important when we're looking at um, productivity being slightly better on Rousey than it is on Feral. So this is a map from Rousey in 2018. Um, there's eight tags in this uh, mix. There's a little X there where, where Rousey is located and you can see a lot of the birds are going towards the north and west and some are going down towards the south. And we can overlay the successful birds compared to the unsuccessful birds and this was really fascinating. So we're seeing here that the successful birds tend to be going to the north and the west and the unsuccessful birds to the south. You can also see that the maximum range of foraging for the successful birds reduced compared to the unsuccessful. So that was amazing to see and um, Liz Humphreys went to step further and looked at uh, the sea depth in that area and you can see um, just out to the northwest of Rouse there's this area of particularly deep sea and um, this allows for different water columns um, in different temperatures and the swell within those water columns can provide some really nutrient rich feeding areas so um, obviously that could be a sign that that's a particularly good place to go and feed. So then if you um, overlay the successful birds which are the yellow dots with the black circles there from 2018 eight tags they look to be going out towards this particularly deep area of sea. Then you can add on the failed uh, nesters, which are going in a different direction. I mean, there are some that go out towards the area, but the majority aren't um, traveling in that direction. And then the black boundary lines are marine protected areas. 
And this particular marine protected area, one of the reasons for its designation was um, due to it being an important location for sand or lava. Um, so the currents and the swells within the sea there uh, are particularly favourable for sand eels and obviously uh, the sort of thing that the Arctic schools might be uh, stealing from orcs and kittiwakes and other seabirds. So have a quick look now at the thermocron data. So we're seeing here, we're just measuring the temperature. It's pretty stable towards the beginning of this incubation period. And then we see through the camera traps, something happens with a herring gull and an uh, egg disappears and another egg rolls out the nest. Um, and then you can see when the incubation um, of that nest cup just stops. So you can work out kind of, um, if you've got the laying dates, you can see if the incubation was long enough for the eggs to hatch or if it was cut short, you, you could kind of draw the conclusion that the nest probably failed. So they're really useful for that sort of thing and quite an inexpensive um, piece of kit for, uh, well, I'm thinking waders, seabirds, anything that's nesting on the ground. Um, so that was quite useful to see. And if we um, marry these up with camera trap footage, then we can start to do a bit of detective work. So on the left here, we're seeing a bird that, um, a nest, sorry, that was apparently abandoned and the eggs were just sat there for a day or two. And then eventually some birds from a different pair because they've got the, the little colorings that the, the, um, the parents for this nest didn't have these rings on. So we know they're different birds who come in and just uh, mopped up the abandoned eggs and eaten them. And then if you remember back to the bird that had traveled almost 600 kilometers from Farah, which I showed you earlier on, that bird came back to the to Farah because it had the GPS tag on. So we know when it came back, it had a camera trap on the nest. It swapped over uh, birds uh, at the nest and um, its pair went off to feed. And then the next thing you see is an Arctic skewer, which looks like the adult bird with the tag on eating its own eggs. So that might suggest to us that the birds um, gone on a really long trip and decided that enough's enough, come back and thought, well, I won't waste the eggs, I'll just eat them as well. So you start to pick up evidence of birds eating their own eggs, which is uh, particularly worrying, but you also have Arctic skuas eating each other's eggs. And rarely at this point did we see anything to do with great skuas and nests. So that's quite interesting as well. And then on the right here, we can actually look at um, uh, birds feeding chicks, there's a little chick there as well. So there's lots of stuff in this camera um, trap footage that um, could be quite interesting to look at as well. So we have a quick look through the wintering and migration uh, maps now. So this is uh, one of the birds that took a while to catch, but we finally um, finally got it. It was very tame, so uh, just used to sit around watching us while we watched it. And there was lots of standing about. We didn't know if the birds were going to go back into the nest traps, which is how we were catching them in the following year, having experienced it the year before. But luckily, they weren't that bright and they did tend to go back into uh, back into the traps. And then you get this little tag bag that's been on a massive adventure for a year or two. And it's just amazing when you actually manage to catch a bird and bring the tag back. So in 2018, we saw eight of the nine birds that were tagged in the previous year. Four of them attempted to breed and we caught all of them. Um, now, not all seabirds will breed every year and the Arctic skuas seem to have a year off now and then they're quite long lived birds. So um, I think it's not such an issue that they might have a year out um, unless you're trying to catch them for GLS uh, to get their GLS tags back. Um, but also it could be a sign that they are struggling as well. And in 2019, two more tag tags were retrieved. So if we look at the wintering locations now, we've got the Fair Isle birds, um, 2017, 2018 in circles, and then the Rousey birds in triangles. So the Rousey birds are these two here, and the rest are from Fair Isle. We're not suggesting that the birds uh, overwintered in the Sahara. These are rough and ready results. They're going to be uh, refined uh, in the coming months. So it should give us a more accurate location where these birds have been. We can see that they're pretty well spread out in the winter. And if I draw your attention back to the map we looked at earlier, we can see that in the north, uh, sorry, in the west of Africa, there, there's a little area where birds are overwintering, not going any further south. And that's obviously missing from the other maps. That's quite exciting. And um, we had a bird that um, 
we couldn't catch in 2018, but fair old bird observatory managed to catch it in 2019, which was fantastic. So I think the warden used his children as bait, but however he did it, I'm really pleased he caught this bird because it allowed us to look at two years worth of wintering data. And we can um, lay these data over one another. So we've got 2017, 2018 there, and then 2018, 2019, and we can see the birds going back to the exact same location. So that's uh, quite interesting as well. It'd be great to get some more um, samples like this and see if it's the same for other individuals. So they're, they're staying in quite different locations in the winter, but the same bird looks like the same bird goes back to the same place. So if we look at autumn migration, we've got birds um, traveling down, seem to be hugging the coast and going down um, to their wintering grounds. Uh, around the mid-September, there's the equinox, so the data gets a bit um, messed up. So just ignore those red dots there. And then um, this ties in quite nicely with some Trek Delling telling Sea Watch data from Cornwall, which shows that the birds that are tagged as they're heading south, um, the Sea Watchers are seeing some higher counts off of the coast of Cornwall. So that's quite nice to tie those two together. And then in the spring, the birds are traveling back up. They seem to be doing a bit of a loop, or almost heading towards Greenland, then coming around under Iceland and back to Scotland. And obviously the routes they're taking, it's quite important to know about this for things such as uh, wind turbines. So not just, in the forage, uh, not just in the breeding season when they're foraging, but also when they're migrating as well. So we might have um, caused more questions and answers here, but we have found out some pretty uh, important stuff. So we're, we're thinking that foraging distance uh, can limit breeding success, but marine protected areas could be helping birds um, with their breeding. Um, we wonder if heat stress is an issue, and that might be something that we look at uh, in more depth. Uh, we wonder whether Arctic skua, uh, great skua get a bad press or if they really are an issue. So um, we have about 60% of the global population of great skua nesting in the UK. So they're pretty important as well to, uh, to be um, looking after these birds. Um, but also, are we missing the impact of great skua because... Um, because their, their biggest impact on feral anyway is after the birds have fledged their chicks and that's kind of when the mon nest monitoring ends. So are we missing some of the impact the great schools have on Arctic schools? Um, and we can see that wintering distribution varies between birds. It doesn't matter which colony they're coming from. They'll go to different places in the winter, but it looks like the same birds are going to the same place. And how important is that? Does that impact on their breeding season the following year or their um, chances of survival over winter? So fieldwork is finished for um, Feral uh, for now. David and Helen continue to monitor the birds on Rouse 8, so there could be some more tagging scope there. Uh, Liz Humphreys is leading on the data analyses at BTO and also looking to work with um, other Arctic skua enthusiasts from around the world um, to collaborate, um, put our data together and produce some uh, papers looking at the birds at a global kind of scale. We'd like to grow the monitoring um, in the UK and globally, so um, trying to get a better handle on what the birds are doing in the UK and um, elsewhere as well. As technology advances, it would be great to do more tagging, um, get more precise data for longer periods of time. So that will come as um, technology advances. And we'd also look, like to look at the diet of Arctic skuas as well um, into the future. So just a massive thank you to um, my colleagues at BTO for um, starting up, helping and continuing this project. Um, we've had some um, in, amazing donations from members of the public, British Birds and SOC. So they've all been helping to, to fund this work. Of course, um, we've got the volunteers on Rouse 8 without who we couldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to do the field work on that island. And Fair Isle Bird Observatory have helped us uh, immensely in our fieldwork on Feral. So thank you to everyone who's helped with this project. Really appreciate it. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Sarah. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, so let's go to some of those. Let's take one from within Zoom. Uh, and this one asks, has any work been done on the potential effect of residues of chemicals within the birds? No, not that we know of. Um, I've, I've not heard of any studies looking at that, and that would be um, that would be really interesting to see. Um, it's not really um, residues of chemicals, but we did have um, 
the student out on Fair Isle when we were there and she was going around all the nests and looking at um, plastics within um, uh, pellets that the great schools have been regurgitating. So I think there's a lot of work with plastics, but maybe not um, chemicals. So that would be quite interesting, yeah. That's great. And uh, another question here. So do male and female birds differ in their foraging ranges during incubation or chick rearing? No. So we, um, I didn't show it here because there's so many amazing maps to show you that I couldn't fit them all in. But um, yeah, we have got a, a map which shows the males and females and where they're foraging. There's massive crossover. So we don't think there is a difference there. Great. And I'm just jumping across to Facebook because we're streaming uh, this session live um, across YouTube and Facebook. There's a question on our Facebook channel that says, how much benefit would be gained from joining up the marine protection zones you showed on the map? And is that likely or possible? Um, I mean, the more, the better, I would think. Um, but I'm not sure if that is something that... Um, is being looked at at the minute, but yes, yeah, so potentially that could be quite useful. It seems um, whether it's the sea depth and the importance of the area anyway, or whether it's the marine protected area that's uh, making that little patch to the northwest of uh, Rouse so productive, but um, whatever's happening up there, it, it looks like it's almost working. Um, so there was a clear, a really clear evidence that shows that the birds that were going north and west were just doing better and they were heading to this deep patch in a marine protected area or it just seems a bit of a coincidence. That's great and just and still on the subject actually of the marine protected areas uh, there seems to be a concentration of records um, outside of the MPA boundaries uh, and this question about why birds go to some of these areas which actually seem to be unproductive why aren't they just going to the areas where the productive birds go? Yeah well th this is something that I've been asking myself for um, the last couple of years now yeah it does seem that you know some of these birds are even passing the successful birds that are going somewhere else and they're just um, it appears that they're just set in their ways and they just go down to the same place all the time and they don't seem to be able to adapt to going somewhere else um, very easily and it might be that eventually the successful birds that are going to the to the good feeding areas have chicks that then go to good feeding areas and things might improve there but um, yes why they don't just go west instead of heading south somewhere it we don't know great i'm going to take two more uh, so there's a, a question here is there any suggestion of a link between the overwintering locations of the birds and their breeding success so this isn't something we've looked at yet um, but that would be um, a really interesting thing to look at so i think there's two things that we need to do here we need to get some more tags out um, so we get some uh, more data on multiple winters and to see if the birds really are going to the same place every year. So at the minute, we've only got a tag from one bird that has given us two wintering locations. So it had the tag on for two years. All the rest only had the tag on for one year. Um, so if we can get some more data that proves that the birds are going to the same place every winter, then you can start to look at that in uh, comparison to their breeding success. And all the birds with GLS tags on with the overwintering locations. Um, they've all got Darvik rings on, which have got a unique code on. So it would be fairly easy to find out where they're breeding and look at their breeding success in the following year, in theory. Um, so yeah, that would be something that we'd definitely be keen to look at. Right, and then here's a, a slightly more technical one. Um, and this is about the, the tags and harnesses. So what is the basis of the decision to use glued satellite tags rather than a harness mount, which is obviously what BTOs used for cuckoos for longer term detailed location data? Yeah, so this is something that we might be able to do in the future. So because this has never been um, done in the UK before, we were playing it safe really, and we were using the least, um, Kind of intrusive method of fitting the the gps tag to the bird's back which was just to simply glue it onto the feathers um, see what the impact of that is because they only really then last for about uh, anything between you know 25 to 40 days on the bird's back before the birds manage to either just pack, peck it off or the glue's failed so it's not kind of a really permanent thing and we can just see how the birds are reacting take it steady um, the birds were fine. We were watching them a lot. We saw them coming straight back to their nests after they've been tagged. And um, so now going forwards, it might be something we can look at in the future, definitely. Yeah. 
That's great. That's fascinating. Thank you ever so much for that. I'm sure the audience would applaud uh, quietly at the end of their their lines. Um, what I want to do now is invite up uh, onto stage uh, Kit Jewett, who some of you will know as Yolo Birder. Uh, you might know him from his Twitter feed. Um, he is uh, co-founder of the Probable Bird Society through the production and sale of bird-related uh, Clothing has raised over £12,000 for a variety of conservation causes, including RSPB, work by BTO, Wild Justice and Birders Against Wildlife Crime. And he recently curated Red 67, the book published by BTO earlier this year. And he's currently thinking of what to do next. And um, what we're going to do is have a, a little bit of a chat, a discussion about uh, some of these projects and the work with which uh, Kit has been involved. So if Kit would like to come up on screen. Okay, hopefully you can see Kit. Right, well, I can't see Kit from here, so I'm hoping Kit can hear me. And yeah, hi, Mike, I can hear you. And I can see you, fantastic, great. So, Kit, I mean, you're, you're a birder. You're known for Yolo Birder Twitter feed, which is great fun. If, if people are on Twitter and they don't follow your feed, they should because it's great fun. Uh, always brightens up, particularly uh, wet afternoons when people can't get out birding and are feeling a bit challenged. Um, you've done a, you know amazing amount of fundraising work through Probable Bird Society. And I wondered if you could just kind of set the scene a bit and tell us a little bit about the society and really what got you started raising funds for, for conservation. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. Um, so it, it was all a happy accident, really, I think, if I'm honest. I started Yolla Birda initially a good few years ago now. It was just a, a, a bit of fun, really, a, a way to take a light-hearted a light look at birding and birders and really just making silly jokes about gull identification and how ugly coots' feet are and, you know, making silly flow charts about pipits and warblers and how to identify them and and it was all like you say just a just a bit of fun and and um hopefully something a little bit different um but then in i think it was about 2015 one of these silly tweets i did was a, a picture a line drawing of two wrens overlapping like a, a venn diagram and i called it wren diagram um and people seemed to like that and that kind of took off a bit and not wanting to uh, sort of over egg a pudding. Um, I, I then did a hen diagram, which was two overlapping hen harrier heads, a male and a female with the extinction symbol as in, in the, the sort of inner uh, section there where they overlapped um, just to sort of highlight the, the, the sort of perilous nature of the, the status of hen harriers in the UK and their declines. Um, and people asked if it could be a t-shirt and I decided to, well, give that a go. How do I do that? So I'll, I'll just show what we knocked up at the time. Um, I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but we did do the, the design as a, as a T-shirt. Um, and uh, I, I, I was helped by a, a mate of mine called Stu Graham, who's a graphic designer, and he helped um, tart up the diagram and make it something that people would engage with. And yeah, we sold 400 of those T-shirts and all of that money went to... Um, uh, RSPB Skydancer Appeal and split with Birders Against Wildlife Crime. And through that, we, we had to create a shop to sell them. So we, we sold those on Etsy um, and we had to give the shop a name. And at the time I'd been joking a lot about probable fairs, goals and uh, their identification and called the shop Probable Bird Society. And so from from there we, we we've done lots of sort of uh, charity t-shirts you know we did a raven one to help wild justice i think i don't even think they were called wild justice at the time but they were um fighting a legal a legal battle against the the raven cull in scotland so we did a, a shirt um gave all the profits of that to them to, to help with that um and we also just did a lot of silly stuff that we really liked which was you know riffing on birds and largely bands, you know, a lot of rock related uh, bird t-shirts, uh, scoat ahead and, you know, various silly things like that. We had to sort of watch ourselves because I think we got, we got 
very carried away and I'll just I'll just show you this we we did a range of plectrums based on puffins and designed them as the four members of KISS I, I mean I'm not sure that you can get more niche than that but um so yeah we we tried to keep it still a, a little bit silly um whilst raising some money um and like you said in the introduction there we as probably a bird society we raised probably about twelve thousand pounds for bto rspb birds against wildlife prime wild justice uh the uk little owl project we also gave some money to and the fair isle bird observatory which obviously sarah's has been talking about when they had the horrendous fire we gave some money to them as well fantastic and it, i mean you, you talk about it being niche you know and you know Kiss isn't a band I'm into, but there are lots of people that are into Kiss and, and rock and that kind of stuff. And you know, it's great to kind of see those two different interests kind of brought together in this in this way. And it's clearly not completely niche because people are buying the stuff and supporting, you know, and really getting behind it. And and it's that kind of element of humour. I think that, that really interests me. I mean, do you do you feel that's really important in kind of birding and conservation? It is for me. Um, I think, you know, I. I well, it's, it's just, I think in terms of conservation, um, humour for me is probably just one angle, one, one approach that might work for some people, but, but maybe not for others. Um, different people respond to different things, though I sometimes find personally that it's sometimes, you know, a lot of the, the information out there can be quite dry. You know, there's, there's a lot of press releases and, and appeals and, and things. And, and sometimes when you're having a heavy day, maybe, some of those heavy messages can 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 be sort of hard to read um and my attention spans may be quite short or, or my time to to dedicate to that side of things um and that there's a lot of different causes out there so i think striking a balance between being light-hearted and you know being taken seriously and getting your message over is is, is probably very important and I, I hope i've achieved that but probably not always um you know, it is it is a, a slightly tricky area sometimes, but I think largely smiling has been shown, hasn't it, in, in studies and things like that to, to make people feel better. And, you know, and if you're happy, you'll, you'll maybe feel more likely to engage with something. And I think it's got to be a hook for some people. Um, but I think the other, the other thing is that, that this is just a hobby for me, really, and it's, it's something I love doing in my spare time. But you know, real conservationists. You know, I've I've managed to meet a few over the over the years, um, and make friends through this. Um, and generally, they're they're very, you know, good natured and and good humoured people as well. Um, and I don't know whether that's that's something to do with the the demands and the dedication of the of the work, um, and being able to smile in the face of adversity and if the great British weather, I mean, you just have to hear Sarah talking about her work to, to, to realize that you've got to be very dedicated. And I think there's got to be a, a you know, some humor in there to, to get you through some of that work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's something, you know, we've kind of been exploring at BTO, how do you reach other audiences going beyond just the dry scientific peer reviewed papers, the reports and that kind of thing. And the work we've kind of been doing around arts and culture approaches is, is about that, you know, it's a different way of engaging people in these messages. And I think it humours exactly the same. And, I, and, and what I really like is, you know, people are buying items of clothing like t-shirts with scoter head and stuff on. And, and they obviously appreciate the joke but they're, they're comfortable and confident in sharing that with someone else because they're out there wearing it and that kind of thing. And, you know, in a way, it's a lighthearted look at birding. So as a bird watcher, you're not taking yourself too seriously no. if you're comfortable, you know, wearing those, those kind of things. This um, session is obviously focused on red list birds and, and you've, you know, come to the fore in that kind of era over the last year because of Red 67 and the work around um, the red list. Could you say a little bit about that and, and how you kind of arrived at, at Red 67? Yeah, so the the UK Red List obviously also gets called the, the Birds of Conservation Concern List. Um, and it's a, it's a way of assessing the status of the UK's regularly occurring bird species um, by using a strict set of criteria and, and applying each bird into a, a traffic light system. So red, amber and green, classification. Um, and so the, the 244 species um, with breeding, passage or wintering populations in the UK 
um, we're assessed by experts from a range of NGOs um, and assigned into one of these three categories, red, amber, or green. Um, and the, the fourth iteration of the list was the one that I really focused on, uh, was published in 2015 in British Birds and, and written by Mark Eaton of the RSPB, um, who's a, a, another Northeastern lad. Um, and 67 of the birds uh, in, of those 244 were put onto the red list um, in that, in that um, publication. And having read that, I just thought that 67 was a lovely number, well, not a lovely number for the number of birds on the red list, but it was a lovely number in terms of a, a book, a coffee table type book. And I started to think about that um, and, and that it would be something that would maybe engage people and, and raise some more money. And um, so started to, to explore the possibility. And then obviously yourself, Mike, and the BTO decided to, to, to run with it and to help publish that and to make it a reality, which was, you know, a dream come true, really. And so we, we, we did the book um, as Red 67, um, associated with um, a bit of an art project alongside it and launched that on Valentine's Day of this year. Um, and and all of the all of the profits from the, the book and the sale of the 67 original artworks has been split between RSPB and BTO to um, fund further work into addressing the declines of, of the birds or some of the bird species in, in the book. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's not your first book, is it? Cause you, you did a book project, quite a different book project once before. Yeah, I did. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can, while we're chatting, see if I can share my screen um, to show, to show that because that's where the idea all came from really. Um, and it all started on Twitter when I, I came up with an idea of, um, well, the original idea was to, to send a blank notebook out to somebody who would then draw a bird like a, a, field, a field guide sort of sketch, and then they would post it to somebody else, and then ultimately it would get filled and come back to me. Um, but that didn't really seem like it was going to be a possibility, and it would be fraught with difficulties and take ages. So I decided to try and get um, people to send me pictures of birds, and then I would put them all in a book. Um, so I did. I, can you see this? I'm sharing my screen. I, I think we're seeing just the the Explorer. So actually, it's quite small ah. little icons rather than the actual. Ah, image. right. Apologies. I'm, I'm not quite sure. So uh, I think if uh, Yian, who's looking after the technical, uh, could. That's it. Oh, share your desktop. That was it. It appeared and then it disappeared. Is that working? Um, no. No. Ah, uh, well, right. Um, how about that? Perfect. There we go. So, so everybody sent in, um, well, I'm, I'm saying, you know, put this tweet out um, and just a little silly sketch saying, Bung it, draw a bird, send it to me, and I'm going to make it into a book and we'll auction that and give all the money to um, bird conservation. And I got 99 well, I stopped at 99 and, and basically in the order that they came through my letterbox, um, I got them bound into a book. It turns out that a, a, a birder who's again based in the Northeast um, called Matt Parsons is a book binder and he managed to um, combine the 99 pages into a lovely big coffee table style post, uh, post bound gold leaf, you know, embossed bird book and it went on spring watch. Um, to publicize it and Chris Packham did a picture there you can see that one was a, a, a very stylized picture of a sparrowhawk um, and yeah we auctioned that and that with some other associated things around it raised three thousand pounds as well and here was just a few of the illustrations that that we got for that book um, hope you can see these but this was Steph Thorpe, um, Andrew Mackay, Joe Brown, Richard Allen um, Carl Seabode and Chris Packham. So yeah, we 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 got some brilliant illustrations. Um, uh, this was Stuart Sexton and Will Rose, and finally Matt Sewell. Um, so I'm just going to close that now. Um, but yeah, so that was called Ninety Nine Birds, and that that's what kickstarted it all, really. Um, and but that was just a one-off book. Um, that was one unique copy. Um, but it got me thinking about uh, what to do next. And, and then 
reading the, the, about the red list, um, I then started trying to think about right, okay, how do I do? How do I do something similar? Um, and this time involve writers. I'd I'd not I'd recently done tweet of the day on on Radio One. Uh, sorry, uh, Radio Five. No, Radio Four. <laughs> <laughs> apologies bbc um and yeah just those stories those little snippets and those personal tales i wanted to sort of try and capture that in book form um and so then started the process of initially going back to some of the people who'd been involved in 99 birds and then you know reaching out to, to other people as well I was going to say it's quite. I mean, it's an ambitious list. I mean, you know, okay, you know, people like Chris Packham and, and Co. But actually, it's, it's much broader than kind of just conservation and birding. You know, um, you've got Anne Cleves, who obviously wrote Shetland, um, yeah. and Vera. You know, a wonderful piece from her. And and most people won't realise that her husband, her late husband, was a keen birder uh, and worked, you know, in, in the field and stuff. And and just the different voices you've kind of brought to that book you know that you've created is, is incredible really what was it like kind of going out you know is it what's what's it like going out and asking people to kind of do this and particularly the artists because you were asking them to donate an artwork which was then yeah. being auctioned as well I think you know it was it was a case of just being being fairly bold and um brass necking it for me you know I, I really didn't expect to get the response and I think that the vast majority almost everybody in fact that I asked agreed to take part and and those that didn't it was it was more about not that they didn't want to or feel that they didn't want to be part of the project it was more because the timing wasn't right for them or you know there was some other some other reason and I think you know I, it was completely humbling really and and just um downright amazing you know that that people were willing to give their time and their craft and you know uh, a lot of these are the artists in particular you know these are these are people who sell their work for a lot of money and you know they've made a name for themselves and i really didn't really didn't expect it um especially the ones that maybe are cold called that i'd had no interactions with before um and maybe just i was a fan of their work from books that i own or haven't seen stuff um out there so and and likewise with the writers I started off with people that I'd maybe interacted with or, or knew a little bit. I tried to target people who, you know, I wanted some conservation, but I also wanted some human stories. I wanted I wanted the full range, um, you know, so getting some people in who worked with these birds, you know, um, Sarah Harris, you know, Jamie Dunning working with Twite, you know, people who could, could give stories specific about the birds that were um, in the book. But then also just giving other people the opportunity to, to, to pick their favorite because they might have a nice story about it. Uh, I wrote about the red wing, you know, just because I love thrushes and I've got a cool story about a red wing, um, but not because it's a it's a bird that that I'm particularly concerned about or or anything, but it was just nice to write about that. Yeah. Um, so I mean it wouldn't be fair to kind of ask you for your favorite artworks you've got one of the artworks uh, from the book up on the wall behind you um or likewise you know the pieces of writing but are there red list species that are particularly important to you kind of in the book yeah I, I mean like I say I, I did write about the red wing but that wasn't that was more just a just because um I, I thought I could write about that one um and there was people that that could write about other species far better than I could um but I think in a book like this people almost expect to to see, you know, the the sort of poster boy birds, the hen harriers and the turtle doves and nightingales. Um, and I think everybody knows about the the worrying declines of, of those kind of birds and puffins. Um, but just, you know, speaking to people and sharing the list when I was getting writers to 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 look at the bird list and, and to pick one, it was, you know, quite often, you know, commented on that it was just so sad to see all the common birds on the list. Um, or what would be perceived as the common birds, you know, starlings and herring gulls, linnets and song thrushes, these kind of birds. And I think, you know, we all have sort of attachments to those kind of birds. So I think for me, it's almost like, you know, those kind of birds and, and particularly the sparrows, house and tree sparrows, you know, two are my favourites. I've got, luckily, I've got thriving colonies of both in my garden and my tree sparrows have had three broods in one nest box this year. So 
um you know but i i love those little guys and and i think i would probably put those those up there and also the the birds that are local to me that i, I see regularly you know kitty wakes on the tyne uh, the rosy turns up the coast um you know i love seeing so you seeing those um i do it like you say it's hard to have favorites um i do worry about the birds that you know, even since this last list came out in 2015, may have already gone as breeding birds. You know, um, golden orioles and field fair, I don't think have been recorded for, for a number of years. And then obviously turtle doves, as I mentioned, and certain waders such as Wimbrel are, are massively on the decline. But I think if I had to pick one, I would go with the hen harrier. And I know I've just said that about being a poster boy, but you know, these birds are incredible stunning iconic birds of the uplands and i think there's something about the fact that their declines are, are caused by persecution rather than you know habitat loss or climate change this is something within our gift to to stop um so i think yeah hen harry is the one i would probably hold closest to my heart and it's the one that hooked me into all of this as well Fantastic. And just, you know, just on the subject of Red 67 and, and the response, I mean, it's, it has been absolutely incredible. I mean, we were really surprised at BTO, just how much appetite there was for the book, how much interest from such a broad range of audiences. You know, it, it's had a lot of traction. You know, Mark Avery, Stephen Moss have both voted it their favourite book of the year, best book of the year. And, you know, it, it is a real testament to, to what you've done. But and, and to me, that kind of underlines the power of, you know, art, conservation, writing, bringing in those personal stories. But do you think there's more, you know, and particularly what other things do you think we could be doing to make people more aware of conservation issues? I'm sure there is. I mean, but there's, there certainly is a lot a lot going on out there. And I think if, if lockdown's shown us anything, it is that, you know, people do want to engage with wildlife and nature um, people seem to appreciate the outdoors more and, and um, have, have learned the importance of that almost throughout this. And a lot of people have taken refuge in that and not necessarily the people who would have counted themselves as wildlife enthusiasts or lovers before. Um, I think it's really important to continue to look for different ways to engage different people and to reach out. I think one of the things that struck me um, is the popularity of Chris Pack and Chris Packham and Megan McCubbin's self-isolating bird club. And that's just been a, I'm sure, just a, an idea they had in their kitchen and came up with and made it happen. And they get thousands of viewers, you know, and that's, you know, um engaged a lot of people. I know my mother sits and watches that religiously when she would have probably not engaged with um other things other than maybe stuff shown on the BBC. So it just it just shows you that. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, these can all be useful tools um, if somebody's got a good idea. Um, I think as well, one thing I'd hoped to, 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 to look into is engaging more children um, at an early age. I know that's something the that BTO does um, look at as well, but one of the things we'd hoped to do with Red 67 was um, to take it into schools or some schools one of the writers, Miriam Darlington, had uh, come up with an idea to put a little um, a work pack together for young school age kids um, about Red 67. And that would have been lovely. But then COVID came along and, and, and that didn't happen. But I think engaging children through art and culture would be a great way to spread the word. When I was a kid, and I've, I've been talking about this recently, but when I was a kid, um, we got shown a, a program in school called Look and Read to teach you to help with read and write. And one term, there was a drama as part of that show and it was called Sky Hunter and it was serialized every week and it was about kids and the illegal trafficking of peregrine falcons and, and how they um, sort of saved the day, these three plucky children. Um, and that's what sparked my love of birds. And, you know, that's obviously been a lifelong sort of passion. Um, so I think if we can sort of do some things like that um, to engage kids at an early age, that would be fantastic, whether it be through, you know, school work modules, children's books, even, you know, wildlife apps on their phones, you know, whatever it is to hook them in. Um, but I think overall, you know, for me, the, the, the loveliest thing about Red 67 has been the collaborative nature of it all. The people I've met, the, 
the fact that I just kind of had the original idea and and sort of tried to make it happen, but got all of these people together who who really are the uh, you know without them it would have been just an idea in my head. Yeah. So what I mean, what's next? Because obviously you know, Red sixty seven, we're we're just about sold out of the third and final print run. But what what's next for you? What's next for Yolo Birder? Um, well, I had I had planned a a Red sixty seven event in the northeast, which was going to involve you know, a day long trip to see Kitty Wakes and then talks from some of the um, the contributors all culminating in a gig with Fife Dangerfield, who wrote in the book as well. And I, I hope to, if if COVID nicks off, finally get around to doing that. Um, you know, that would be a, a nice sort of swan song for the book, I, I think, if if we can get that together. But Yolo Birda and, and what I'm going to do next, I think I'm... Um, like every man and their dog, I'm starting a podcast soon. I've recorded a few already and, and they'll be sort of um, put out in the new year on a weekly basis. And that's going to be called Golden Grenades. It's named after the the plummeting twin clenched fists of the Peregrine Falcon, um, as coined by J.A. Baker in his book, The Peregrine. Um, and I'm going to get weekly guests on talking about their favourite birds. And then I'm going to convince them that the Peregrine's better. Um, so it'll be hopefully a bit of a, a, a light-hearted but but fun chat with a different guest each week. Um, so look out for that. And then I think you know after five years, it's probably time to wrap up Probable Bird Society, and I think maybe change that into something fresh and new for the future. Um, so I'm thinking about you know where to go with that. I've still got t-shirt ideas, but I'd like to maybe freshen it up and, and collaborate with some different people and, and um, on some different ideas. Um, and I think the way I look at it is if, if Probable Bird Society was a band, then, then maybe think of Blur becoming Gorillaz or, or The Jam becoming The Style Council, something like that, something a bit funkier and fresh, I hope. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Kit. Just before uh, we go out to some of the audience questions, uh, Andy Clements, BTO Chief Executive, uh, just want to say a few words and give you some news on what we've raised with Red 67. Andy. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. Hi, Kit. Hi, Andy. Um, well, it's really good to meet you this morning. And uh, what a privilege to hear you talking about this extraordinary project. It's kind of revolutionised how the BTO has been able to engage with different audiences. And for us to be part of this project with you has been really transformative for our organization. And I think for conservation, you know, your idea was just outstanding and to be able to be part of it in lots of different ways um, has been a real gift for our organization. And I just wanted to say thank you for that and uh, how much I've enjoyed you talking about it this morning and you know somehow or other we we really we're a some people would say that maybe a decade ago the BTO was a bit of a stuffy scientific organization but somehow or other we completely get the way in which you've described the the genesis of this project and and what it was aiming to do and the sense of humor and fun and a sideways look. And for the BTO, linking together art and science has been some, something of, of, of a journey we've been on for you know, a decade or so now. And to culminate in, in Red 67 with you has been, has, has been part of a, a fantastic thing for us. And I love the way you've talked about it this morning. You know, um, you, you kind of, uh, reference the fact that birders are a bit of an irreverent lot, you know, and I'm a chief executive of an organisation, but I'm an irreverent birder too, <laughs> you know, and there are lots of those stories really, uh, really resonate uh, with us. You've mentioned golden orioles probably going extinct since the beginning of this project as breeding birds in Britain. I'm, I'm reading um, Helen MacDonald's uh, new book, uh, Vespa flights at the moment and she taught one of the chapters is about going to see the Golden Orioles at Lake and Heath in probably one of their last years when they were present there as nesting birds so I think this book coming along now as it does is a very very uh, important thing. Um, just before I do the big reveal on, on what the project has raised I just want to show 
uh, the audience. So this is Dotterel out of the book. Uh, Dotterel's my favourite British bird, and 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 you know this kind of represents such a lot for the BTO. Fife Dangerfield uh, wrote the words for this. Uh, he's the lead. The he he was the inventor of the band Guillemots. Uh, uh, which we, you know, I already knew, and to see his name in there and his writing in this book um, was was really great. And and then Dan Bradbury from the World Land Trust did the artwork for Dotterel, and you know, it just kind of that that point you made about collaboration. It really emphasised how people came together from all sorts of walks of life uh, to make this this book a reality. That that towards the end of what you were saying, you mentioned children. And of course, having Dara in this book and some of the other young conservationists, really, really important uh, for the BTO. You may know we've got a youth advisory panel now and we've just recruited some representatives regionally to help us with the profile of the organisation. And these young people, once again, I feel are transformative for us. So I just wanted to thank you and, and let everybody know that the overall income from this book has topped 70,000 pounds. And that means when we take off all the costs of producing it and so forth, that there's more than 39,000 pounds worth of profit has been able to be split equally between the RSPB and the BTO. Uh, and that's for work to continue on red listed birds of conservation concern. So Kit, you know, your idea was not just a great idea for a great book, but it's a really important contribution to helping conservation for the future. And I'd really like to thank you, first of all, for your brilliance in your idea, but also for your generosity in involving um, BTO and RSPB in this project. And indeed the generosity that you you engendered from the contributors, all the wonderful contributors in this book. It's been a real privilege to be part of this this morning, Kit, uh, to hear you talking and to meet you. Thank you very much indeed again. Oh, that's that's amazing. Thank you so much for, especially for those uh, kind words. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that it's raised so much money and it and it and it has made a real difference. You know, it, it just I think for me shows that. As what seemed to me to be a pipe dream or a silly little idea in my head, you know, sometimes you've just got to you've just got to go with it and and try and you know put things out there and and, and give it a go, and and look for people to help you. Um, and and as I mentioned, you know, really it is just from me a, a, an idea that I, I kind of helped along um, by bringing, you know all of these talented wonderful generous people on board um but thank you for the bto supporting it um you know without without that i probably would have never got it off the ground um so i think you know the collaborative element to it has has made it all all possible and i'm just absolutely thrilled and chuffed a bits that that the bto feels it's been a success and it's raised you know nearly 40 grand that's, that's absolutely incredible thank you yeah. That's great. great. And just, um, I'm just going to go to questions, Kit, because we've got a, a few questions that have come in. Um, what The first one was about the cover design. Where did the cover design for Red 67 come from? Well, that was, um, you know, my, my partner in crime, um, who's a, a mate of mine of, over many years since school, called uh, Stu Graham. He, um, you know, worked with me on, on the, the Probable Bird Society, and when when the book was coming together, um, he I asked him if he'd like to do the cover, and that was all his idea really. So he came up with that, which is a really striking, you know, bold image, um, you know, and it's 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 really helped I think push push it out there and make it so visually um, recognizable that that arrow pointing down the way um, with with the little ring oozle, and everybody loves a ring oozle. Um, so yeah, that was all his idea. That's great. And, and that kind of answers one of the other questions actually about the cover, which is why is there a ring oozle on the cover and not any other bird? I think, yeah, I, I think that was just, a, you know, design aesthetics, you know, a black and white bird fit in and, um, you know, yeah, that they're a bird that both Stu and I loved. So um, 
he picked that and, and visually it worked. Fantastic. So there's there's a, quite a few other questions that aren't questions there. Congratulations. So people clearly love the book. Um, someone asked actually a question I can probably answer just about the fact that is it available in major bookshops? Yes, we, we've been distributing it ourselves as BTO to maximise the returns um, on the sales. So it, Waterstones, for example, um, has had it. And actually Waterstones did an event at one of their branches with some of the local contributors, which was absolutely fantastic. So it's on all the, the major bookshops. Uh, the one place it isn't uh, is Amazon, um, and that was a, a decision on our part not to stock it through Amazon just because of the margins that they work to. We'd rather the money went to conservation and research rather than to, to a, a giant like Amazon. So um, let's leave that there uh, in terms of questions. Just finally to say, we've got, I think, about 300 copies left in stock. So we haven't got lots of stock left. If people are interested, they're on the BTO store. Um, and there's a shortcut that will, that will take you through to the Red 67 stuff. It's just bto.org slash 67. And that's the number six and the number seven. Uh, not too late for Christmas. And it makes a great Christmas present. It's a really, really lovely thing. So thank you so much, Kit, for joining us. And thank you so much for you know, coming up with this project, making it possible and generating all that fantastic support and finance for research and conservation here at BTO and also at RSPV. So thanks. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. So our next and final speaker is Annette Fayette, um, who is a seabird ecologist. She's junior research fellow at the University of Oxford and uh, a National Geographic explorer. She tracks the journeys of seabirds to discover more about their life at sea the places they use to feed and to migrate and the threats that they face. She uses, um, or she studies multiple species um, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. But the birds that she studied most and which she's going to talk to us about today are Atlantic puffins. So please welcome to the stage, Annette Fayette. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen. So that can start presenting. So thank you very much for um, inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the research I've done with Atlantic puffins in the last sort of nine, nine years or so, um, mainly trying to understand what they're doing when they're at sea, um, when we can't see them. And uh, one of the reasons for this was to try and understand why um, some of the populations have been declining. But before I start talking about puffins, I want to say a few words about seabirds in general. So seabirds breed all over um, the planet. They've, um, they breed across all oceans and they're possibly the world's greatest travelers. Um, so Sarah Harris already talked about the fantastic journeys that Arctic skuas do, um, but there's lots of other examples. So for example, um, you can see here a gray headed albatross um, and these birds on their non-breeding movements, so during um, after breeding, can do this extraordinary journeys literally circling um, our planet, uh, which, is, which is really incredible. But you don't have to be a very large seabird um, to have long movements. So this is uh, one of the smaller seabirds, a leechy storm petrel, so they're really tiny. And yet they have these incredible migrations as well. So this is an example of um, leechy storm petrels breeding in um, Eastern Canada and migrating all the way to the mid-Atlantic and for some of them uh, to the Western coast of, um, of Southern Africa which is incredible. But probably the, the champion or the winner of um, the long distance travelers in seabirds is the Arctic tern, which breeds in the Arctic and every winter migrates to the Antarctic and back. And what that means is that over their long lifespan, they might clock up to 2.4 million kilometers on migration. To give you an idea, that's approximately going to the moon and back three times. So these birds have this extraordinary capacity of traveling across oceans for very, very long distances. Unfortunately, they're threatened and actually seabirds globally are some of the most endangered birds on earth and their numbers are estimated to have declined by around 70% since the 1950s. And that's really happening all over the, all over the, the planet. They're facing many threats, some of the key ones Species. So this could be rats, mice, or here an Arctic fox that can um, eat the eggs and the chicks and sometimes the adults. 
but they're also facing multiple threats at sea. And some of the top ones here are from fisheries, both because of overfishing and also bycatch. So the birds getting caught in nets and hooks, um, but also um, through climate change. And climate change may affect the availability and the abundance of the prey that the seabirds need to, to eat uh, to survive. But also, for example, cause uh, extreme weather events like storms that can lead to uh, massive mortality as well. And puffins are not an exception. Unfortunately, they are, um, they've been declining um, for several decades now. So puffins breed all across the North Atlantic, but the declining populations mainly are in the Northeast. Um, uh, some of the big populations in Norway and Iceland, but also the Northern UK. And actually in 2015, they became endangered in um, the IUCN list in Europe and they're vulnerable um, globally. And we wanted to try and find out a bit more about why this was happening and why these populations declining. That's not easy to collect at sea. So they'll only come to land to breed for a few months in the summer, usually on remote, inaccessible islands. And then the rest of the year they're at sea um, and it's very difficult for us to observe them. We don't really know where they are or what they're doing. So it's only with the start of tracking technology that scientists have really been able to explore um, and study seabirds at sea. Now they started um, in the 1990s or the early 2000s and initially the technology was huge. You can see on this uh, penguin, these really large devices and they could only be deployed on very, very large birds. Now, luckily, things have got better. Um, and so, for example, at the bottom left, you can see an example of GPS tags I uh, used at the beginning of my PhD nine years ago um, on Manx shearwaters. And then on the bottom right, you can see devices are now even smaller uh, and lighter. So these are tags I've used uh, very recently on puffins. Now, these are tags uh, which are GPS tags. So they rely on, sat they rely on satellites to um, find a location and they give you a really precise location, which is great. However, if you've ever left the GPS on your phone for a very long time, you will have uh, realized that it drains the battery pretty quickly. And so the problem is that if we want to study the non breeding movements of seabirds when they're out at sea for maybe eight months, this sort of technology cannot work because the batteries would need to be too big. So instead, we use geolocators that Sarah Harris mentioned before, which are much, much smaller, and um, they can last for multiple years. And they're actually so small that we can put them on a plastic ring around, um, on a, around a bird's leg, and they can stay there for years. Uh, so this example, for example, only weighs one gram. So the way they work is, so they work without satellites. So the way they work is based on light levels. So essentially, if you know the day length where you're located, then um, you can work out um, your latitude. So how far north or south you are. And that's because, for example, now we are in the winter in the northern hemisphere. If you go north, the days are becoming shorter and vice versa in the southern hemisphere. And if you know the time of sunrise and sunset, you can also uh, work out how far east or west you are. Um, and that will be um, giving you your longitude. And that's because the sun rises and sets at different times around the globe. This causes jet lag, for example, when we travel to the US. Um, and so with this two information, we can work out approximate position of the bird. So that's not as accurate as GPS, but that allows us to do this for a much longer period. Uh, and it's great for uh, long distance movement. So this is an example, you get a light curve with light, night and day, and you can link that back to positions in the ocean. So most of my research is done on Skomo Island, which is a small island in Pembrokeshire, Southwest Wales. It's uninhabited. You can see here, this is the warden's house and this is where I stay when I do my research. Um, and this is an island that's absolutely uh, full of seabirds. So if I told you that on this picture, there are tens of thousands of seabirds, you probably wouldn't believe me, but actually there are, and they're all underground. And that's because Skomo is the world's largest um, population of Manx shearwaters. So if you come during the day, there are Manx shearwaters everywhere in the burrows, but you can't see them. But if you're lucky enough to be there at night, then it becomes an incredible spectacle with thousands of birds flying around. And Skomo is also an important colony for puffins with between 20 and 30,000 puffins uh, breeding on the islands. The puffins also breed in burrows, which means that um, I spend a lot of my time with my arm um, down a burrow. Um, sometimes it's quite nice, sometimes you get really muddy uh, when it's rainy. Um, but so that's, that's the location where I work. Now to give a, a quick introduction 
Uh, to pearls, for those of you who may not be very familiar with them, they are very long lived. On average, they can live for uh, 20 to, to 30 uh, years, but actually the record is 41 years old. And they nest in underground burrows, as I mentioned, and they're monogamous. So they'll keep the same nest, usually with the same mate for a long time. Sometimes they keep the same mate for life. They're quite territorial, so they'll get into fights uh, if uh, intruders come nest to the nests. And once they can, once a year, they can only uh, raise one chick a year called a puffling. And once the chick hatches, uh, they can then start bringing food to the chick. And that's when you see puffins carrying this big, big full of fish uh, back to the colony for the chick. And I've got some camera trap footage to show you um, that I've recorded in various places. So for example, this is what puffins do at the beginning of the field of the season when they come back. Um, they actually give their burrow a good spring clean. So they'll just clean out any mud uh, that might remain or maybe extend it a bit. Then you see there's a nosy neighbor coming to check it out. And once they've done this, they'll then collect uh, some material uh, to the nest and make it nice and comfy. So you can see here, this bird picking a little bit of grass. And I mentioned that they keep their mate uh, year after year. And this is the behavior that mates do a lot. It's called billing and it's quite funny to watch. Uh, so they just tap their beak against each other. Um, and as I said, they can also get into fights. Uh, so this is a little squabble here that you can see. Uh, that's not a very long one, but sometimes they can get into very long fights for, I've watched them fight for over 30 minutes. So the big question when I started studying puffins was where are they migrating? Um, there had been only one tracking study done in the North Sea at the time, um, but otherwise we didn't know where they were going. And actually in the past, scientists have tried to work this out. Um, in the 1950s, there's been a study where people went on plane and crossed the North Atlantic over a hundred times to find out where these big flocks of puffins were. And they could only count five puffins. So really, um, there was this mystery of where are all the puffins going in, in winter. Now, because I'm using these geolocators, I need to recapture the birds the year after to download the data to know where the bird has spent the winter. And that requires a lot of patience. So I spend a lot of time watching puffins. And sometimes I've got to get close to their burrow so that I can catch them. And that requires some camouflage. So here is an example of a cold weather camouflage in Norway and then slightly warmer one in Wales. And I can spend many hours um, under this camouflage blanket waiting for the right bird to come back. But when they come back, I have to be very quick to get to the nest because they might only stay for um, a minute or so or less uh, feeding the chick in the burrow. So I've got to get there before they leave again. But anyway, after that, um, once you've got the puffin, you can then deploy the geolocator or retrieve the geolocator and download the data that tells you where it's been. And this is an animation showing you some of our results from Skomo Island. So each of the little dots is a different puffin. Um, and there's quite a few things to say um, from these. So the first one is that actually these puffins are growing really far. So if any of you have seen puffins in flight, it, it looks very tiring. Basically, they're not an albatross. They have to really, they have short stubby wings and they have to flap very fast. And so it's very energetically demanding for them to fly. So we really didn't expect them to go that far. Like for example, you see this bird is all the way in the Labrador Sea across the Atlantic. The other thing that was really interesting is that usually when you track a population of, of birds, they will migrate into like a few main destinations or perhaps just the one, whereas these um, birds seem to all go to different places. It looks like each puffin has its own migration route to its favorite place. And when we tracked birds um, for multiple years, we found that the puffins kept going to the same place. So the one in the Mediterranean Sea always go to the Mediterranean Sea and, and so on. And this sort of explains why people didn't notice big flocks of puffins at sea in the winter before, because they all go to different places. Now, once we'd found this out, uh, this was really interesting, but I wanted to know more about how, you know, the other populations of puffins around the North Atlantic. Um, so we expanded the study by collaborating with puffin researchers all around the Atlantic, um, and we tracked puffins, nearly 300 puffins, with these geolocators at 13 different populations, covering all the major breeding grounds of the species, including um, in Ireland, in Scotland, Norway, um, Iceland, Canada, and the US. And here are some of the results that we got. So for example, um, puffins from uh, the Bay of Fundy in the US almost didn't migrate anywhere. They just stayed near the colony for the whole year. Um, and this is data from birds from Newfoundland. So they went a little bit further, including in the Labrador Sea. 
Um, and these were four colonies from Iceland and they all went to the Labrador Sea. So all the Icelandic puffins seem to do the same thing. This is data from uh, the North Sea colony, the Isle of May in Scotland that I've mentioned before. So most of the puffins stay in the North Sea, but a few will come uh, towards the Western side of the UK. And finally, this is data from Honoya, which is very far north in, um, in Norway. And there the puffins spend most of the winter in the Barents Sea, but actually some of them will, uh, will go uh, west. And actually you can see one crazy bird went all the way to the Labrador Sea and, and back, um, which is a really, really long migration for a puffin. And so if you put things together, you have this uh, rather complex map uh, where you can see that different populations really do different things. But this also allowed us to identify areas where puffins from multiple populations were wintering. And so these were really uh, important areas to protect for multiple populations. And another really interesting result we got from this study is that actually the migration strategy of these puffins was reflected in how well they were doing at breeding the next year. Um, so basically those who had to migrate further or migrate to places with uh, lower habitat quality bred less well, they were less successful at breeding the next year. And that's really important because that tells you that if you want to understand why uh, a population or a species is, not, is having a low breeding success, you can't just look at the breeding season. You have to look at the whole year, at the whole annual cycle. Now, however, these results weren't enough to explain the really, really strong declines observed in some of the populations um, in the Northeast Atlantic. So we also wanted to learn more about what was happening during the breeding season. And some of my colleagues um, had suggested that this might have been linked to resource availability, so availability of food. But the problem is that the feeding ecology, or there's loads of aspects of the feeding ecology of puffins that we don't really know very well. So for example, we don't really know how far they feed. They hadn't really been tracked before. Um, we, don't, we know about the chick's diet mostly, but we don't really know what the adults eat. And we don't really know how different populations differ in these aspects and how this influenced their breeding success. So this is the sort of things that we were trying to find out. Now for this, we had to use that GPS tracking technology to ha have the precision uh, for this short distance movement. And I used these really tiny tags because puffins are known to be quite sensitive to tracking. So these tags were only two or three grams. And we used them uh, to track the movements of birds when they were going out at sea to catch fish for themselves and for their chicks. Um, and a bit like the technology that Sarah Harris presented earlier, we also used some tags um, that needed, that could be downloaded into a base station so we didn't need to catch the birds again. We complemented this with camera traps and the idea is that we wanted to know um, how frequently the birds were coming to feed their chicks. So um, this helped us to identify that and also perhaps look at sort of amount of fish they were bringing and what type. Um, but that doesn't tell you what the adults are eating, only the chicks. So we also collected lots of poop samples from the adults um, to do a DNA analysis to identify the, pre, the prey they had eaten in, in these samples. And as you can see from this difference in colors from these few samples, there's quite a lot of variation even uh, within a colony. And finally, using uh, usually a boroscope, an infrared camera, we monitored loads of burrows uh, to work out breeding success on the colony. So the idea was really to get a complete picture of the feeding ecology of the puffins. And because we wanted to know um, what was causing these, drive, these declines in the north, um, we studied multiple colonies at the same time, including some doing really well, like Grimsey in Northern Iceland and Skomer in Wales, but also some doing really poorly, like the Westman Islands in Southern Iceland and Rust in Norway, which um, is the world's second largest colony of puffin, but it's doing really, really badly. So the population there has declined by 81% since 1979. This once had millions and millions of, of puffins and now there's less than 200,000 pairs left. Now, I didn't do this on my own. Um, so I collaborated with uh, researchers both in, Ice, uh, in Iceland and Norway, uh, but also with Lucas in the US who did all of the DNA analysis of the poop samples to work out diet. And this animation illustrates some of the movements of puffins from Skoma. Uh, again, each dot in a different color is a different bird. And again, we found that these birds were going much further than we thought. Um, we would expect puffins to feed within 10 or 20 kilometers from the colony, but some of them were going much further. Um, and that's not very good because that means they can't come back as often to feed their chick, but also because flight is so costly for them, then they get really tired and exhausted. And this suggests that there's just not enough food near the colony, so they've got to go further. 
And what was really interesting is that when we look at the different colonies, we found that there was a really strong correlation between how far they had to go to feed and the breeding success. So on those colonies where the birds were feeding very close, the breeding success was high. And on, the, on those colonies where they had to feed much further away, the breeding success was low. And in, in Norway and Southern Iceland, where breeding success was really low, the birds had to go sometimes 100 kilometers away to find food. And so what that means is the, the chicks weren't fed often enough and, uh, and breeding success decreased. And this was also supported by what we saw on the camera. So here, this is just examples from three colonies. And you can see these are all sand eels, but in Wales, the sand eels are quite nice and chunky. In Northern Iceland, they're so small, you can't see them. Um, and so what that means is that not only the chicks are getting fed less often because the birds have to go to feed far, but they also don't get fed with nutritious prey because these tiny sand eels and these tiny fish larvae are not very nutritious. That means that on a colony like Skoro, you have plump and healthy pufflings, which have high chances of survival. Whereas in Norway and Iceland, we just kept finding uh, dead chicks, such as dead chicks, uh, just starved. So why is this happening? Well, in Norway, the herring stop uh, collapsed in the 1960s, and that was uh, caused partly by overfishing, but it recovered in the 80s. But there's not been a strong herring year since 2004. And what's happening is that there's now large scale changes in sea temperatures and currents which are affecting the growth, the survival and the drift patterns from the spawning grounds to the puffing colonies. And so there's just not enough fish around for the puffins to eat. And in Iceland, it's a little bit similar. We know there's already the uh, something called the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation that is a cyclical um, environmental uh, factors that change the availability of sand eels, but this is being amplified by global warming and that is really affecting the growth of the sand eels and also the timing. So what's happening is that there's just not enough food nearby near these colonies of puffins and also there's not enough good food even further for the chicks and that leads to really poor puffin breeding success in the northeast Atlantic and ultimately this leads to population declines because there's no new uh, young puffins to come and replace the older ones in the populations and so the population declines. So to conclude, this is really, um, it shows that tracking technology can really be a useful tool for seabird conservation. So not only these studies have uh, given, given us insight into what's happening to these puffins, but also, for example, the migration data that I've presented earlier um, was used and shared with BirdLife International, who used it alongside loads of other seabird tracking data to come up and propose a new marine protected area important for seabirds in the Northeast Atlantic, which is currently under review by OSPA and will hopefully be approved soon. Uh, so overall, by using technology, we really get an insight into the ecology of seabirds, especially when they're at sea and we don't know much about what they're doing, and especially combined with complementary methods, such as the diet analysis, for example, can really help us obtain a much better picture of the bird's ecology, and that helps us understand what are the threats they face and how to inform their conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. We've got a, a stack of questions uh, coming in on Zoom. So if you're happy, we'll, we'll push some of those through to you. So uh, we have this one from David Clothier, which is, we saw how these fascinating birds fly right across the Atlantic to the Labrador Sea. Do you have any data about how long they rest on the sea during the course of their journeys? Yes, uh, so they, that's, that, you're right, it's an incredible flight. And actually the first time I plotted the data of this bird crossing the Atlantic. I thought I'd done something wrong and I did plot the right thing, but no, they really do do that. Um, they do not fly into a long, this isn't a long sustained flight at all. It would just be too much for puffins. So actually what they do is they'll sit on the water very often. They'll do maybe an hour of flying, sit on the water and so on and so on. But for example, that one bird that you saw in the Labrador Sea crossed the Atlantic in about 20 days. So that is still pretty quick. Wow, that's amazing. There's um, a couple of questions that are kind of centered around uh, colonies and exploitation. Um, so is there any evidence that puffins are moving from colonies that are declining to colonies that are doing well, or are they site faithful and just return to the same place every year? So this is a good question. The, so one thing is that this is very hard to tell because uh, to be able to identify immigration or immigration from between colonies, you need loads and loads of birds ringed so that you can then identify where they come from in different colonies. And there's just not enough ringing of puffins at a large scale to be able to tell that. 
However, there have been anecdotes of puffins moving between colonies. But the, the main picture is that they are quite philopatric. So they will tend to return to the colony all the time. Once they start nesting there, they will just stick with it. And so um, it might be, especially the young ones, which are more prone to movement, but because on these colonies, the young ones just don't survive. Um, this is not, there's no evidence that this will be a way by which these populations can move um, somewhere better. Okay, cool. And then, um, so I kind of said related to that. So is there any rela relationship between puffing colony, winter dispersal distance, and the level of exploitation of their main prey species around the colony? And I'm guessing that's human exploitation of the prey base. Um, well, that, that's a good question. I, I don't actually know, actually, but I think this, uh, this isn't what is driving probably the main movements because um, we see, for example, that Icelandic birds all go um, towards the Labrador Sea, but there are puffins from Norway that migrate to Iceland. Um, so this is this is more complex than that. And for example, on, on islands like Skoma, this is even more weird because different birds do different things. So some of the birds will remain near Skoma and some of the birds will migrate elsewhere. So we think that what we don't really know what's driving their migration. This is something we're interested to find out. Um, but we think that it might be more related to um, their movements in their early life and whether uh, whether they've explored this area and if it was good food at the time, whether they then stick with, with these locations. Um, but as, as for the questions of uh, how exploitation near the colony influences migration, um, th we don't really have a straightforward answer to this yet. Okay. And, and just in uh, the question here around sand eel, I mean, the, the question's quite kind of brief. It says, are we harvesting too many sand eel? Do we, do we have information on kind of how those stocks are changing and, and their impacts on birds like puffin? Yeah, so I've, I've mentioned... Um, the role of, of climate change on affecting sand eel populations, and there may also be a role of, of uh, fisheries. So for example, when there was a lot of sand eel fisheries in the North Sea in the past, this had a bad effect on, on seabird populations. And when the fisheries closed, then the seabird populations went back up again. So there's definitely potentially a role of this. But what we observe, for example, in Iceland is that these sand eels, um, it's not that there are fewer sand eels, it's just that they're they're just so small. They were literally tiny, tiny larvae. Um, and so as Sarah mentioned before, there might be basically a mismatch now in the timing where the sand eels are growing and uh, when the birds need them to feed, uh, which, which is caused by environmental um, change. Okay. And, and, and is there any evidence that marine protected areas close to colonies are beneficial to puffins? Well, that's... Um, that's an interesting question. I think, so there's actually a lot of these colonies are not in marine protected areas. Um, Skoma is, for example. Um, however, now that we've seen how far these birds feed, uh, this may need that, this may mean that they feed well beyond the protected area anyway. However, I think that obviously the main thing that we could do to, to reduce these effects would be to um, stop climate change, which hopefully will do, but it will take a long time. And so implementing strict marine protected areas around these colonies could potentially help if it reduces the pressure on the birds and increases the amount of fish near the colony a little bit. Great. So I'll take one final one that's coming on Zoom, and this is um, about the tracking data. And it seemed to show that puffins were flying over land, e.g. Ireland. It, do the trackers show altitude data and are they flying at height? or is the breaks in data transmission masking their flight around the coast? Yeah, that's exactly that. I, sh I should have mentioned it actually. So that was in the migration data. Um, that's because we just linked different points uh, and we only have a point every few days sometimes. So they do not fly over land. They stay at sea, but some, some of the points where we're on land, but this is due to sort of um, location error that, rather than actual, um, actual data. And we think that mostly puffins will not fly at very high altitude. Great. Okay. Well, we'll leave the questions there. Sorry, we, we, we can't take any more. Um, thank you so much uh, to Annette and to Kit and to Sarah for some great talks. Um, I'm sure you've all enjoyed them. Um, it's, it's great that we're able to take them out to a broader audience this year um, through the virtual format. And that's definitely something for us to think about uh, going forwards, um, perhaps alongside uh, a physical conference next year. So I'd like to thank everybody for, for giving up their time this morning for, to give the talks and also to you, the audience, for, for making time to, to come and listen to them.
As I mentioned right at the start, you know, our research at the moment relies more than ever on the support that we get. And, and that's really true, particularly things like the, the work with the skewers, uh, the work that we're doing with cuckoos, where it's individuals that are helping to fund that work and support the research teams. And, you know, there are many ways in which people support us and many of you support us, you know, through your volunteering, through your membership. Um, but if there are opportunities for you to um, add and increase your support, uh, then please do. I mean, particularly looking to the future, these are tough times for charities, they're tough times for BTO, and we really appreciate all the support that we receive. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, I hope that some of you will be able to join us for other sessions later on. Our next session is this evening. Uh, it kicks off at 7 p.m. And our director of engagement, Yian Evans, will be working with a panel um, of youth representatives and others talking about the ways in which uh, we and others can get more people involved uh, and get more youngsters involved in citizen science uh, and bird watching. Thank you very much for joining us.